Well, um, if I have time, but I don't want to take more than my allotted time because we have uh, Ebony to come and uh, Ebony, Ebony, sorry, Ebony to come, and um, I want to hear her. Um, but I'm going to start. Uh, I'll, I, if we have time, I have some more images, but they're not essential to what I'm going to say today. I'm going to start with eight assumptions that I think are behind or underneath atonement theology that are just assumed almost they're not they're not really challenged or questioned very much but they're they they support various forms of atonement theology um, and so i'm going to clock through eight of them and i'm going to offer what i think is a, an, another way to think about the these assumptions so uh and i i have to say i come to christianity from having been raised for the first five years of my life in a Japanese Buddhist family where my grandfather was actually a lay Buddhist preacher at the local temple. So he was a more serious Buddhist um, than, than, than a cultural Buddhist sometimes is. And, um, and I, so I spent five years of my life in a very loving, gentle, caring family in which my grandparents did a lot of the raising because my mother worked as a Red Cross nurse in a US Army hospital in Fukuoka, Japan, where she met my birth father and my stepfather. So when I came to the United States at the age of six, learned English and got plopped into a military Protestant church, uh, Christianity did not make a lot of sense to me. Um, I did what my Sunday school teacher said, which was to read the Bible from cover to cover when I was about 10. And I concluded that God was mean um, and that this was not somebody that I wanted a closer relationship with. And um, and I spent every summer from first to sixth grade in August in southern in rural Mississippi going to Southern Baptist revivals and church services, and I somehow failed to be saved. <laughs> so so um, it, I really wasn't even interested in uh, Jesus very much as a as a historical figure or as a person of faith until I went to college. And then I took, took some Bible classes at Chapman University that changed my whole understanding of, of Jesus as a justice worker and Christianity as part of a 2000 year old movement um, that protect that believed in the justice and mercy of God. So, so I come to Christianity without having been immersed in atonement theology and it's so it's never really resonated with me particularly or emotionally. Um, but I've realize that being a Christian makes me part of, of something very profound that's 2000 years old, that's work for justice. So, those, so that's the way I come to atonement theology and I wanted to just put that out there. First assumption I think that's crucial to atonement theology is punishment makes people moral. So uh, that, that's the idea that you will go to hell or that there's that you will be separated from God um, unless the, si the sins that you carry are, sorry, that's my cat, are atoned for. Um, and I believe that punishment, sorry, my cat really wants to be part of this. Um, punishment is a form of power and control, not rehabilitation. Um, and and uh, it requires hierarchical structures like master, slave, king, subject, father, child, to reinforce the power system that inflicts punishment because you can't punish someone that's stronger than you are. It's hard to do. Um, and that children, especially as weak and small, are subjected to this kind of violence first. And there's plenty of research now in trauma studies on adverse childhood experiences that affect people for the rest of their lives if they're not processed. Um, and they can affect your longevity, your capacity to work, your health, and all kinds of things. So I do not believe that punishment makes people more moral or that it's good for people. The second assumption is that witnessing violence creates a subjective change toward love of the victim. This is the moral influence theory. That witnessing violence creates a subjective change toward the love of the victim, especially in the perpetrator of the violence or the one being protected by the violence. Um, there's really almost no evidence that this is true uh, in any psychological work on violence. Um, experiencing or witnessing violence is traumatizing to people. It is not redeeming of them. 
for example, children witnessing domestic violence is one of those early childhood trauma experiences that affects people for the rest of their lives. Um, and being um, the perpetrator of violence has been studied in military veterans who have killed in combat who are twice as likely as other military veterans to commit suicide and the veterans as a whole have much higher suicide rates than the general population. So um, being a perpetrator of violence and, do, and then seeing your victim doesn't necessarily make you a better person. It may make you kill yourself. Um, so I don't think that the use of violence in any form like that is um, uh, love at all. It's a trauma bond. And it gets confused as love because trauma bonds are actually emotionally so tight that they can override healthy love. So, um, so that's uh, number two, witnessing violence is a problem, not a redemption. The third thing is that learning that someone suffered on our behalf makes us love that person. Um, the suffering of others can be a serious debilitating burden on us. Um, and uh, Mariana Hirsch, who's a literary scholar, has done a really interesting study of survivors, children who are the survivors of Holocaust. So, so they are children of Holocaust survivors. They themselves did not experience the Holocaust. And what she saw in some of the literature and work that is produced by the children of Holocaust survivors is that they feel like their own lives are sort of trivial and gray and uninteresting um, compared to the trauma of their parents' generation. And, um, and sometimes they will actually sort of swallow or take in the trauma of their parents' generation as their own experience of trauma and right from that perspective. And, um, and she, she says that, that that is a kind of um, way that the trauma never gets healed. It just keeps being perpetuated generation after generation when people take on the trauma as their own. And that is different from historical memory where people can remember what happened to the people they love and tell the story so that it won't be forgotten, but they don't experience the trauma in their own bodies and, and physical systems as their own trauma. And, and that's a difficult distinction, but it's an important life-saving distinction um, to not experience post-memory, but to experience historical memory in relation to previous generations of trauma. And I think that when someone has suffered in a previous generation and you relate to that person, it can actually Tra traumatize you in a way that's not helpful. So just having someone suffer on your behalf from the past is not necessarily redemptive. Um, the fourth assumption is that suffering is sacred and makes us more holy. Um, and um, you see this in what happens to Mary, Ma to Mary, the mother of Jesus from the early Christian images of her as the mother of God holding her infant son, looking very pleased and um, calm and loving, um, to being the bleeding heart, the woman who suffers in sorrow with her son, um, that her whole purpose in life then is sanctified by her ability to suffer like her son um, and, and because of her son. And, the, and that, that sanctification of suffering is part of atonement theology. I believe that suffering must be alleviated as much as possible and comforted with lamentation and remembrance and steadfast, enduring love from those who remain. I do not think suffering is, sanct is sacred or sanctifies people. It just is. We all have suffering. It just is. Um, fifth assumption that love as self-sacrifice is the highest form of love. I believe self-sacrifice can leave trauma in its wake and can inflict moral injury on survivors, especially if they had anything, any kind of role or relationship to the reason for the self-sacrifice. Um, 
moral injury is when you experience shame or guilt or humiliation or remorse um, to the point that you have an identity crisis and your character is changed negatively. That's what um, has been studied in military veterans around um, moral injury. So in fact, I don't think love can exist in aloneness. Without two parties to love, there is only loneliness. Sometimes, and with self-sacrifice, it can be tinged with guilt or gratitude. There are all kinds of complex feelings that go um, when uh, someone sacrifices themselves on your behalf, and those are not always positive. So it's not, I don't believe that love is self-sacrifice really kind of fits very well with the idea that this is the ultimate kind of love we want. Sixth assumption that love as desire is selfishness. And Augustine quite, you know, had quite a lot to say about lust um, as a problem, um, but that's not the only fo form of desire. Love as desire can be wanting deep connection to what or whom we love. It is the source of wanting justice, beauty, pleasure, peace, family, and community in our lives. We have to desire these things to seek them. So desire and as love is not selfishness. It's wanting greater love. Um, and that's why I called my first book a Christology of Erotic Power, uh, just as a footnote. Um, Seventh, that evil must be, this is another assumption, in, I think, embedded in Thomas theology, evil must be overcome and ended for goodness to flourish. Um, and that shows up, especially in ideas of God having to destroy the world to save it um, and rebuild it um, at, because the human sin is, you know, taken control and God has to win. There's a sort of language of, of conflict and victory in that. So I think it's important to remember, and this is how I think more about evil, the serpent was in the paradise garden from the beginning. It was not human sin that brought the serpent into being. It was part of creation. And the powers of violence, deceit, cynicism, which is different from doubt, by the way, I think cynicism is different from doubt, but cynicism and hate are part of the fruits of trauma. Um, and I've come to that conclusion partly because I've spent some time working with people in San Quentin prison who are in for life sentences. Um, and I've observed a rehabilitation program in that prison that helps them remember their original trauma as children, which is what drove them to the, I think you can hear that train whistle, right? <laughs> it's behind me. Um, uh, that that when you can help people understand the original trauma in their lives from childhood that left them with all of these terrible feelings in their um, psyches and they can release that trauma, they don't reoffend. And in fact, they don't not just not reoffend, but they can take full responsibility for the harm they've done and regret it profoundly and do their best to be good people after the, they've processed their trauma. Um, so as long as violence is made theologically necessary for saving humanity, Christianity, be, Christianity will be part, I believe, of making such destructive powers stronger rather than being a force for love and justice. And then the eighth assumption um, is that faith is found in our private subjective relationships to a higher power and belief in that power. Um, that's how atonement theology worked. Um, is it about your own need to atone for your sins in some way and that Jesus has taken that on out of love for you. And so you can bond with God and Jesus um, because of that act of grace and, and mercy. But it's, uh, it, as Abelard said, it's what happens inside you, and it's between you and God, and the church has nothing to do with it except to maybe confirm that it happened. So atonement theology not only 
reduced faith to this interior sort of internal subjective moment, um, but it eliminated the need for the church basically. Um, and I, so uh, Western Christianity has always had a problem defining what the value of the church is in an ecclesiology because it's just kind of hanging around to hold people who are saved, but the salvation happens to the individual. So I believe actually that faith as fidelity to love is found in an open heart that takes in as much of life as possible in the work of our, it, I found it in the work of our lives to protect and hold fast to bonds of love against all the forces arrayed against love. And in the ongoing struggle to understand the vast mysteries of life unfolded to open loving and questing minds, we also find the work of faith. So, so those are some of the assumptions that I work with in the way I try to think about um, theology and, uh, and faith. And I think I have a little bit of time, hooray, to show you some images, <laughs> okay? Uh, because I think the images give you such a clear distinction between um, the, uh, the life-affirming incarnation view of of Christianity and the atonement based view. So um, it, yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. way more than, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, well, okay, okay, what the hell happened? I'm gonna, I thought I clicked on my PowerPoint to share. Yeah, okay. There. Um, so these are images of the Trinity. And um, there, it's interesting the transformation in the West that happened to images of the Trinity. The first one is in San, Vit San Vitale Church in Ravenna, Italy, the one that has that beautiful Jesus on the blue globe who looks about 15 years old and he's sitting on the globe uh, surrounded by uh, angels and, and bishops. Um, and this is on one of the side panels in that sa very same nave. Um, I think above this panel is the Empress Theodora that I showed you yesterday. But anyway, in this image, this is the story of Abraham and Isaac. Um, so you see Sarah laughing in her hut on the left side. And then you see Abraham with the fatted calf and the tree. And then the three visitors, the three visitors that come to Abraham. Um, and then you see Abraham with his sword lifted up but he's looking into the sky and up there is the hand of God reaching down to grab that sword out of his hand. Um, and you see Isaac on the far right as he is um, on this pedestal waiting for um, Abraham to kill him. And then there's the lamb down in the, in the bottom there that this is the substitute. So those three visitors in the middle of that lunette are regarded as the very first image of the Trinity in the ancient Christian thought. They thought the three visitors were probably the three divine beings. And so they depicted this, this is fifth century. Um, and you can see little loaves of bread even in front of them. Uh, so um, it, it's like there's already a little hint of the Eucharist feast going on with the, with the bread and, and that sort of thing. And this image of Abraham, this, the cycle of the Abraham story was often used as a kind of mirror, a mirror or echo or earlier story that relates to the nativity, the miraculous nativity and the birth of Jesus. Um, and, um, and, then, and then the uh, almost dying, but not quite um, of Isaac. Uh, and Hebrews actually says that Abraham actually gave his son, but he got him back. So that, that's already in the Hebrew text, uh, in the book of Hebrews, that this, there's a reference to this story. And so this is an image of the Trinity. And that kind of sense of the three holy beings, the creator God, the son, and the Holy Spirit, all co-equal, according to the Orthodox theology of Nicaea, um, held for a very long time still is the primary way that Trinity is depicted in Eastern Orthodox churches. But the most famous one, I think, that's often cited for um, how that, that iconography of the three beings keeps 
being repeated is this 15th century one in the lower left called the Rubilov Trinity. And the Rubilov Trinity is in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. And it's, it's quite famous. And I can't remember all the ways that has been interpreted how you tell the difference between God, the creator, and Jesus, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, which represents the church, because, of course, this is what Jesus, through baptism, delivers to baptized believers, and, um, and it's that binding spirit of God that divinizes humanity, so it's sort of like the spirit represents all of humanity as divinized um, by the gift of baptism. And that, so you see the three beings. And of course, in that sense of the Trinity, the church is essential for being the space of the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's co-equal with Christ, the risen Christ and with God, the creator. Um, and uh, in the West, as atonement theology took hold, um, you start to get a very different image of the Trinity and the one on the right, with Jesus hanging from the cross, crucified and dead, um, is by Botticelli. And it's actually from the same time period as the one on the left. But the one on the left is Eastern, and the one on the right is the, uh, is the Western, and Eastern and Western. And, and so the, you can see in the one by Botticelli that Jesus is dead, and behind him is a really old-looking man. That's God. And God has actually got his arms out holding the cross for the viewer to admire with his dead son on it. That's clearly based on the atonement theology and the Holy Spirit. Now, you, there is a Holy Spirit in this painting, but a lot of the pictures of the Trinity in the West you can't find the Holy Spirit, but in this one you can, and you, it's probably a little too small to see easily. But right here on top of this part of the cross between God and Jesus is a white dove. So the Holy Spirit has been reduced from being an equal member of the Trinity to being a little bird that kind of connects God and Jesus. And in fact, a, lo a lot of Western theologians sort of talk about the Holy Spirit as a spirit that binds God and Jesus together with humanity or something. But, it, but really, we have a very weak theology of the Holy Spirit in the West because the atonement made the Holy Spirit kind of unnecessary. Um, and, um, and the same thing in terms of gender happens in a transformation of Mary, as I said earlier, that she she stops being the mother of God and becomes a suffering uh, mother. Um, so the upper picture on the left um, is from uh, the, uh, the monastery of St. Catherine in Sinai uh, is one of the older images of Mary. Um, but you can see in the eighth or ninth century, it's, it's, it's not clear which exact which century, um, on the right, you see a very similar iconography. She's holding the child in almost the same way. She has the same halo. Even the, the garment around her face looks similar. So this is hundreds of years of this iconography of her as mother of God being repeated. And the, the one on the left, that beautiful image of her entire, the throne she's sitting on and all of that is from Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, which was built in the fifth century by the emperor Justinian. And this image was uh, put, they think in the apse, it's the, the, the apse of this church is so high that Mary looks about three inches high when you look up to worship her, um, but she's actually 15 feet tall. And she's as big as they could fit in the apse up there. They made her as big as possible, um, but she's, she's, this is eighth century. Uh, and this iconography is carried through. And she's flanked, as you can see the older Sinai image, she's got angels and heavenly beings and other people around her. And this Mary in Hagia Sophia was flanked by two of the most gorgeous angels I've ever seen. Um, the one that was Michael was taken down by the Muslims when they turned this cathedral into a mosque. But Gabriel on the right there, is, it was left, That's what, I mean, he's been damaged, but he was left because of course the, Gabe, the angel Gabriel appeared to Muhammad. 
Um, and it turns out that the Quran has more verses about Mary than the Bible does. So she is also a revered, a revered figure in Islam. And so she was left there in the cathedral, even when it was a mosque. Um, and the image in the lower left is from around 1400. And it's a, it's a kind of iconography that dominates a lot of images of how Mary holds Jesus, uh, which is his corpse. She's the, she's the grieving mother holding the corpse of her dead son. It's, you know, there's a famous one by Michelangelo in the Vatican. This one's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Um, and it's a, it's a wooden statue. What's interesting about this statue is that yesterday I showed you the first dead Jesus from the year 960, who's hanging as a wooden sculpture that was produced in Saxon land, I think as a result of an, of an imperial terror campaign against the Saxons by the Roman um, Emperor Charlemagne. This also is one of the earliest images of the Pieta, which happens to Mary, also from Northern Europe in the same area where that Giro cross uh, 300 and so years earlier, I'll be mean, sorry, 500 years earlier appeared. So, um, and they are common in Northern Europe around this time, but they proliferate within 200 years all over the rest of Europe. So. It's the same with the crucifixion. It was earliest in Northern Europe, and then it started to expand a couple hundred years later. Um, so, so you get a very different image of what it means to be a mother in this process, um, and also about female power, because Mary is a mother God is a very different sense of her own power as um, the woman who is sacred because she mourns the death of her son. Um, we are at our time limit, Dr. Yeah, okay, I'm I just sorry. have one more image. Please, um, okay, uh, I got five minutes cut off from my time, so I'm going to take a minute more. Um, yeah, this is an image in the in the Saint Apollinaire Nuovo Church in Ravenna, Italy, and it's the first church that we have that has scenes from Jesus's life from the Gospels. And 13 on one side have his miracles and, you know, Samaritan woman and the healing of the paralytic and, um, and other things. And then on the other side are 13 images to start with the Last Supper and go to the resurrection. And for one thing, the 13 that show the Last Supper and all the way to the resurrection, do, they do not show the crucifixion at all. All you see is Simon Cyrene and then the women at the tomb and doubting Thomas and the road to Emmaus. And so in depicting his life, they didn't show him dead. They didn't show him crucified. Um, and, but the interesting thing is what they do to the Last Supper, which tells you something about the meaning of the Eucharist, the communion service for this church. And I think it's evident in some of the earliest Eucharist rituals that it was a feast and not just a symbolic meal. Um, but in this picture, this is from the life of Jesus, and this is one of his miracles, which was the feeding of the multitude. So you see him with loaves of bread on one side and fish on the other side. In the same, and then right across the nave, just, you know, you look at this and you could look across the nave and see this image as the first picture of the story of the passion. And here is Jesus with the 12 um, disciples, apostles, uh, sitting at the Last Supper. And what's interesting about this image is there are loaves of bread and fish on the table and a chalice nowhere to be seen. So the reference point for the Eucharist feast was not the crucifixion. The reference point of the Eucharist feast was blessing the world by feeding the multitudes. And it uh, was a custom in the ancient church for people to bring the feast and everyone who was baptized to partake of the feast and everything left over was given to the poor. So they understood their mission as a church was to feed each other and to bless the world and the ways they took care of and fed each other. So that's my last word on um, a different way of understanding how to be Christian. That's fantastic. Um Rita, I think that you should expect a call from the Alliance of Baptists inviting you to come and do a, an art history in the life of the church whole weekend with us again before much time passes. Thank you for the ways that you have broadened and deepened the conversation that we've been having. Our next speaker is Reverend Dr. 
Ebony Marshall Terman, who is Associate Professor of Theology and African American Religion at Yale Divinity School, having taught theological ethics, Black church studies, and African and African American studies at Duke Divinity School. She's an ordained minister in the National Baptist Convention USA, and uh, one of her books, Toward a Womanist Ethic of Incarnation, gives readers a link between this human Jesus and the human African-American people's experience um, and how those uh, conflate and shift and, and dovetail. She's a powerhouse scholar and speaker and preacher, and her presence with the Alliance of Baptists today elevates our conversation exponentially. Uh, Reverend Dr. Marshall Terman, we are really, really excited to hear what you have to, to say with us today. Thank you so much, Pastor Amy. It is um, just delightful to be here with you. I must offer two disclaimers before I begin um, my talk today. And, and those are that one, I'm nursing a, a pretty bad cold. So pardon um, the, the tone of my voice this afternoon. It is not COVID and we give God praise for that, amen. But um, it is a bad case of daycare-itis, which points me to my other disclaimer. Uh, I have two, um, two-year-olds, two-year-old twins, and so you may hear them in the background. Um, please know they're being cared for by another adult, but if you hear screaming randomly, um, uh, pardon me. I'm going to share my screen with you now as, uh -oh, let's, um, <clears throat> as I am hoping to be accompanied by these slides as we move through the afternoon. So I'm so grateful for um, Dr. Nakashima Brock, uh, Rita, for kind of ending her talk um, uh, by allowing us to look at images of specifically the crucifixion and linking that, of course, to atonement theology. Um, I um, think that this um, offers a, a great segue into reimagining the cross from Black womanist Christological perspectives, which is what I'll be talking with you about today. But before I jump into the specificity of womanist Christological perspectives, um, I thought it might be good, especially for this audience, to spend some time thinking about what womanist, Black womanist theology is as a baseline um, and how it offers um, fodder for thinking about Jesus Christ and the work of Christ in the world uh, very differently, distinctly from um, normative white and or European uh, Christian theology. So let's begin uh, by thinking about what womanist theology is. Of course, it is God talk that emerges from the ways of knowing and interpreting, or what we would call in the academy, the epistemological and hermeneutical privilege of Black women and other women of African descent. Um, uh, Black women uh, orient themselves to God by way of reflection and action that envisions, that debunks, that constructs from within the interstices of race, gender, class, and sexual subjection or subordination. And so when we think about womanist theology, we're always thinking about God talk that is utilizing social indices of race, gender, class, and uh, sexuality as ways to understand, to know, and to interpret what God is doing, who God is, and how we are to be in light of the identity of God. Womanist theology is born as a theological discourse in 1985 out of the discordant confluence of Black liberation theology and white feminist liberation theology and Black feminist um, literature and theory happening around the same time. Up until 1985, when womanist theological ethicist Katie Geneva Cannon would deliver the first paper on womanist theological ethics at the American Academy of Religion, um, Black women were approximately and for the most part completely invisibilized within um, church, certainly, uh, society and academy. Um, I would like to play a clip of Katie Cannon um, speaking to what launched her, what prompted her to develop, along with several others, uh, womanist theological ethics. Um, and this clip is from a 2012 meeting of the Society for the Study of Black Religion in uh, Bahia, Brazil. I learned up until I was 21 years old. Amy, can you hear that? 
colonizado foi sobre o apartheid norte-americano até a idade de 21 anos de idade. Back doors, colored water fountains. Tinha que entrar pelas portas dos fundos, é, tinha que beber água dos bebedouros separados somente para negros. The books we used at my school were the throwaway books from the white school. Os livros que eram utilizados na minha escola eram os livros que eram rejeitados pelas escolas brancas. The only musical instruments we got were the ones they threw in the trash can. Os únicos instrumentos musicais que nós obtínhamos eram os instrumentos que eram jogados na lata de lixo. So when I went to seminary, I wanted to know about a God that would treat black people so terribly. Então, quando eu me juntei a esse seminário, eu queria compreender, eu queria pesquisar sobre esse Deus que tratava tão mal as pessoas negras. Because my parents and grandparents said if we our reward would be in the afterlife. Porque tanto os meus pais quanto os meus avós diziam para mim que a nossa recompensa estaria na, na pós-vida, na vida após a morte. And when I got to seminary, I learned about black theology, liberation theology. E quando eu fui para o seminário, eu aprendi, eu aprendi sobre teo, teologia da negra da libertação. And the liberation for me was in knowing it was a sin to allow anybody to diminish the image of God that's in me. E Nesse processo eu aprendi que era pecado diminuir qualquer pessoa perante a Deus. So I a e dessa forma eu me tornei uma revolucionária. So although here, of course, we hear Dr. Cannon speaking about her experience of, of racialized subordination and that launching her into her own development of womanist liberation theology and ethics, um, it really is um, her, her work and womanist theology broadly is grounded in this understanding that Black women hold of themselves as neither being Black in and of itself and woman and or woman in and of itself, being neither one or the other, but being both black and both women at the same time, all at the same time. And in this experience of being both and, and not either or, black women found themselves experiencing racial oppression on the one hand, speaking of crucifixion, and gender oppression on the other hand, in ways that were very different from those who were theologizing around them and who were situated, um, even within liberationist um, contexts, as one or the other, either black or woman, black, red, male, or woman, red, white. To the contrary, Black women found their experience of oppression or what I identify as social crucifixion to be compounded and exercised in a way that was foreign to the monovocality of the experiences of specifically Black men and or white women. And here is an example from the film Color Purple that shows this distinction in Black women's um, subordination and social crucifixion. Oh, oh, look at that. That's the cutest cute thing I ever saw. Can you give me some sugar? Oh, you're so sweet, you sweet thing. Hey, you're so sweet. Miss Millie, always going on over the cup. Your children are so clean. Would you like to work for me? Be my maid? Hell no. What did you say? Hell no. What did she say? Hey, can't you pump that crude a little faster? Gail, what did you say to Miss Millie? I said, hell. <gasps> oh, Miss Sophia. No! Get me! Get me! 
fuck you are, you fat nigga! Oh, It is out of the experience of being, of the compounded oppressions of being both black and woman uh, in the US specifically, but globally the argument can be made as well. Um, simultaneously, right? Being both black and woman at the same time that womanism as a black feminist standpoint um, and as a theological discourse would emerge in the early 1980s. And for those who are familiar with the trajectory of 20th century theological liberalism, you'll notice the chronological progression of liberationist theological discourse in the US that begins with, of course, black theology in the late 1960s, born from the confluence of the civil rights and black power movements, both of um, whose discourse were um, was largely directed by black men in the persons of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and black male clergy who constituted the NCBC, the National Committee of Negro Churchmen, which would go on to be um, known as the National uh, Conference of Black uh, black churchmen, um, who would, these men would really develop uh, the, uh, the early foundations of black liberation theology that James Cone would later systematize. So black liberation theology is followed, of course, by the emergence of feminist liberation theology. This is arguable during the same time, the late 1960s and the early 1970s, promulgated by white middle class women who um, proximally and for the most part had maids who were black women or women of color. Um, specifically thinking here around feminist liberation theology about Mary Daly and Valerie Saving. But in the early 1980s, Black women began to speak at the interstices of Blackness and womanhood, which had heretofore, as I've stated, been uncharted territory. No one was asking about Black women up until the mid-1980s. And womanist theology then enters the scene as a sort of theological corrective um, to white theology to Black theology and to white feminist theology. It is a theological perspective that centers Black women's voices, their faith, their struggle, their survival, their celebration as the gauge for determining the character of Christian discourse and practice. And as an arm of Black feminist thought, because a Black womanist is a Black feminist, womanist theology opposes all oppression even the oppression of the cross, um, and considers dialogue with the church as one of its primary tasks, which is why I'm so glad to be here. Um, it, it roots its work um, very quickly in the faithful work of foremothers like those you see before you, um, Harriet Tubman, um, Old Elizabeth, Jorana Lisa, for Elaw, they are not pictured, Julia Foote, uh, Mariah Stewart, Anna Julia Cooper, Ida B. Wells Barnett, Nanny Helen Burroughs, and so many other Black women whose project resisted white racism in its male, in its gendered incarnations, I should say, um, and and also resisted black male patriarchy that generally functioned intracommunally beyond the gaze of white male patriarchy that denied black power altogether. So um, black women rebelling against patriarchy, especially as it was propelled by black men and white racism, especially as it, it has been and continues to be propelled by white women, um, they knew something very distinct. They knew that Black men could be anti-racist, but they could be sexist and patriarchal. And Black women also knew that Black that, that white women could be anti-sexist or anti-patriarchal, but profoundly racist. Um, black women um, distinctively said no to both. They would argue that you can't be pro-Black on the one hand um, and sexist on the other because that's not going to save black women. And likewise, you cannot be uh, anti-sexist on the one hand, but racist on the other because that is not going to save black women. Black women um, argue that oppressions are interconnected. If you're racist, chances are you're sexist too. And if you're racist and sexist, chances are you're classist too. And if you're racist, sexist, and classist, chances are you're heterosexist and or transphobic too. Why? Because as Black women's experiences tell them every day, as we saw in the clip uh, uh, previously, right, oppressions are interconnected. And therefore what we find in womanist theology and womanist Christology uh, specifically is one, uh, Black women attending 
to um, what has been identified as triple jeopardy. That is the compounding again of race, gender and class oppression on black women's bodies. And they are attending to this as a unique site of oppression that is unaccounted for certainly in normative white theology, but also in black male um, and white feminist liberationist discourses as well. Um, black women in America who are um, in large part the descendants of, of slaves, right, recognize that um, a white Jesus is racist, sexist, classist, homo antagonistic, transphobic, ableist, xenophobic, um, and um, um, uh, oppressive, really, to anyone who departs from the normativity ascribed to able-bodied white men who perform middle-class um, respectability in public, right? Anyone who defies that normativity is uh, demonized or marginalized. But what Black women also know is that even the Christological postures that portend to a more liberative vision, right, um, are problematic such that, right, you would get uh, one of the matriarchs of womanist Christology, Jacqueline Grant, in her classic text, White Women's Christ and Black Women's Jesus, arguing that the white woman's Christ is racist. Black women don't want her either, right? And you would get um, one of the other matriarchs of womanist Christology specifically, Kelly Brown Douglas, um, who, who, who is at uh, the Dean of Episcopal Divinity School at Union Seminary, and of course, Jackie Grant is at the ITC, um, arguing that the Black Christ, uh, presumed by Black male liberationists, um, is a problem too for Black women because he is patriarchal. And so it is out of this context that Black women begin again in the 1980s to um, endeavor towards speaking of God in Christ um, for themselves and asking the question, who is Jesus Christ today for Black women? And here is where I argue um, three primary strands of womanist Christology is out of this question, um, who is Jesus Christ for, for Black women today? That three primary strands of womanist Christology, I should say Protestant womanist Christology, because we could have another whole conversation about Roman Catholic um, uh, womanist Christology, but Protestant womanist Christology emerge. Um, the first strand is um, the surrogatic Christology that emerges from Dolores Williams' um, treatment of Jesus in her classic text, Sisters in the Wilderness. The second is that of sacrificial uh, sacramental Christology that we find um, emerging from the work of Joanne Terrell in her classic text, Power in the Blood, the Cross and African-American Experience. Let me check my time. And the third is the somatic aesthetic Christology that is found in my work, uh, most exhaustively in my book, Toward a Womanist Ethic of Incarnation. So moving through each of these, um, uh, in the context of Dolores Williams' surrogatic uh, Christology, um, she contends in opposition to black and white feminist theologies that God is not a liberator at all. But in fact, God is partial and discriminating. And this partiality and discriminating identity or, of God is revealed in, in the Bible, right? In both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Um, but she also says, all we have to do is look at the lives of Black women to know that God is partial and discriminating. Black women who are the poorest of the poor in the world, the slave of slaves. Um, to really understand this. And she um, lends significant time to thinking about Hagar, the slave woman Hagar in the Genesis text. So Williams posits that Jesus is actually, right? We can call him the suffering servant and we can call him all these other things. But she says Jesus is just the ultimate surrogate. Um, Jesus is the ultimate surrogate who dies on the cross. And the cross for Williams is nothing but an image of human sin and defilement in relationship to, um, so Jesus as the ultimate surrogate can be related to the surrogacy, both voluntary and coerced, that black women um, have experienced throughout modernity and certainly throughout US history. Um, and, and because of this reality of Jesus surrogacy related to black women's surrogacy, Williams argues that there cannot possibly be anything salvific in the cross. There is no salvific power for the oppressed in any Christian image of oppression, the cross or the blood. 
For William, surrogacy is not sacred. It is not the intention of God for Jesus. It is not the intention of God for Black women or Black people. And therefore, um, Black women's salvation, and I would push further and say Black people's salvation cannot depend on surrogacy that is made sacred by white Western uh, Christian traditions of atonement specifically. Redemption in this regard cannot be found in the cross or its blood. Dolores Williams against um, normative Christian traditions is arguing there is no power in the blood at all. Don't, I don't wanna serve communion. I don't wanna take communion. I'm not wearing no cross. There is no power in the blood, in the cross, and in any image of Christian oppression. Black women's salvation is found in Jesus' life of resistance and in Jesus' ministerial vision that um, he employed to help others to survive. So here's a quote. I'll just skim past that because of time. Joanne Terrell, um, because all Black women don't think alike, we have different things going on. Um, her, she posits a sacrificial, sacramental Christology that picks up on William's engagement of the themes of surrogacy and sacrifice. Um, to contend for Jesus' surrogacy. And um, she argues that this idea that Jesus' sacrifice through death on the cross was the ultimate act for our sins and that it concretizes God's plan of reconciliation is problematic. Jesus, this idea that Jesus is the Lamb of God who was slain, who takes away the sins of the world, is problematic. Jesus is Terrell would agree, the ultimate surrogate. Jesus is the ultimate scapegoat who is at the heart of the New Testament, which is a problem. It is a moral problem for those of us who want to think ethically. And Terrell goes on to argue um, that these ideas are um, um, can be understood as a hermeneutics of sacrifice, right? Sacrifice interpretations that are inherently dangerous. Um, uh, particularly because they have been correlated with a love ethic, right? Your, how much you suffer equates to how much you love someone. Um, I could say more on this, but I, I'll scurry ahead. So Christ um, suffering in this regard is often proclaimed, right? As, well, often, I mean, I mean, it's all of Easter, right? As the manifestation of God's love um, for the world. And thus human suffering is understood as an opportunity to demonstrate God's love in and for the world. In the face of oppression, marginalization, and even death, a hermeneutics of sacrifice calls the Christian to love as the test of authentic faith. And its historical deployment, the historical deployment of a hermeneutics of sacrifice, has often um, placed the moral onus of sacrificial love on oppressed people by calling them to love their oppressor or oppressor classes, even to their own detriment. And there are so many examples of this. I mean, we can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, and it reasons that because Christ was victimized yet victorious, that the Christian that is victimized will be victorious at the end, right? This is Katie Cannon's uh, parents telling her that our reward will be in heaven. This sort of hermeneutics of sacrifice was used to impose the cross of slavery, for example, on Blacks, the cross of um, genocide on Natives, the cross of rape and domestic violence on um, women. And so it's, it's reasonable, Terrell would argue, to contend with Williams um, that we cannot have anything to do with this violent and bloody cross. And yet Terrell argues that we can't actually throw the cross away either. She says, wait a minute, we, we don't want anything to do with this violent and bloody cross, but we can't throw it away because if we throw it away, Terrell argues, then we're also throwing Black people away, we're throwing ourselves away because she argues Jesus' story of surrogacy and Jesus' story of sacrifice is the Black story. And Terrell argues that it's the cross that actually empowers Black people in their suffering to know that God suffers with them. They don't need to know, or the message is not that suffering is redemptive 
or that suffering remits sin, right? Or that suffering is the si a sign of love or victory. But what the cross um, reveals to us is that Jesus suffers with those who suffer. And as co-sufferers with Jesus, we become then sacramental witnesses to the presence of God in Christ in the world. And so to Dolores Williams, there is no power in the blood. Um, Del uh, Joanne Terrell would talk back and say, oh, there is power in the blood. And then in my last uh, few minutes, um, here comes me. Um, um, I come along and I, um, I propose a somatic aesthetic Christology that essentially in like the most millennial register ever asks, what's the use of talking about crosses anyway, right? Who cares if there's power or if there's no power? Um, what's the use of all this cross talk? If we say nothing explicit, nothing substantial, and nothing transformative about the realities of crucified bodies. And so mediating between Williams and Terrell, I propose that the question of Black suffering and specifically the question of Black women's suffering is a critical one for sure, but that it cannot be faithfully responsive to um, the reality of that suffering if we just dwell in the blood. We have to attend to the bodies. That's the somatic uh, nature of the Christology, the bodies of those who suffer, because it's the body or their bodies that have been designated as problems insofar as they deviate from the norms of the arbiters of power. And such attention to the Black body specifically is compelled, I argue, not so much by the cross, because that is the Katasarka realities of our time, and we should not ever be led by the Katasarka realities of our time, but it's compelled by the body of Christ that not only died as a slave on a cross, but was enfleshed in the poverty of a barn. Um, so I'm a Christmas Christian, not so much an Easter Christian, Christmas Baptist, I should say. I know, I'm like, want to throw me out of the Baptist church. Anyway, so so um, I find uh, this as my guiding thought, that Jesus' body was the problem for the church insofar, insofar as it defied normativity. We can talk more about it. And yet it is the body, this very defiant body, that would give birth to a new way that changes the world. And so I would argue that the church ought to be doing more talking about about and praxis around crucified bodies rather than worshiping a 2000 year old cross and it's concomitant blood that supposedly will never lose its power who cares now um with all that said some of you may be um wondering why the cross at all and here come my children in the background so i apologize for that um why the cross at all and um, the next few slides are quite suggestive, uh, quite uh, perhaps even triggering for some. So I just want to give you that warning. Um, they are um, they are quite suggestive, and if you need to turn away, then you should um, take care of yourself now. Um, I'm not sure that we can get to the potential of the body, the potential of the body, unless we attend to the crucified, which requires some consideration of the cross. Um, the cross has been the central motif of African-American theology, although based on my work, William's work and Douglas' work, I push back and say that the central motif of, of, of uh, um, African-American theology is Jesus, which would include, include the whole lifespan of Jesus, not just the cross or his death and resurrection. But the cross is important for Black Christians um, in ways that may make may not make sense to those who are not Black Christians, right? Um, because it is the cross, as Terrell argues, that makes Jesus' story the Black story. And here are some pictures of social crucifixion um, uh, that might make this point a little bit more clear, that Jesus' story of crucifixion, um, um, cursed is the one who hangeth from a tree, right? that Jesus' story of crucifixion is in fact the Black story. So these images are not ancient. Of course, they are modern. And um, 
as you will see some um, some are even contemporary. The story of the cross um, has historically allowed Black people to grab a hold of the Christian narrative and attempt to reconcile their realities of evil and suffering with their belief in, in, in the goodness and the power of God. Terrell, what Terrell asserts as Black theodicy or theodical inquiry, um, right, in ways that are not readily apparent, right, the cross is important in ways that might not be readily apparent in terms of thinking through the Holy Spirit um, as it relates to black flesh, because it's the cross that gets us close to what Dolores argues is what happens at the cross, evil and suffering. Um, the unrelenting suffering of black people yesterday and today, and by the looks of it tomorrow, makes space for the task of theodicy, begging the question, that we heard Cannon ask at the outset of her um, ministry, teaching ministry, how can God be good in the face of so much evil and despair? Which has been the primary question that has guided the birth and development of the Black Christian tradition. And the cross is that which has allowed Black people to wrestle with that question, which shapes their realities and which is not a movie or pictures, but it is the life the lived reality, the, the, the flesh and blood characteristic of Black life. Jesus' suffering and bleeding and dying collides with Black people in concrete ways that they see and experience every day. This is why crosstalk is so important, even as we move past glorifying it. Um, and, and this is this reading of the cross may be foreign to many white Christians in large part because white liberal and even evangelical Christianity um, did not develop in response to the question and reality of black suffering, but it developed in response to the question and reality of white power. Why can we worship the cross within normative white theologies? Because the cross and its ability to oppress the outcast is, the, is power. It is the power of the empire. It is white power. Um, sitting with the cross is theologically foreign to many of us because we have been formed um, and sitting with the cross in kind of rigorous cross-cultural um, context is, is, can be foreign and painful and uncomfortable because we have been formed in white religious contexts that don't ask questions about the suffering of non-white peoples and that do not see Black suffering, that invisibilize it or marginalize it to Martin Luther King Jr. Day. But Black people have been asking the question and will continue to ask the question through Black theologies and through Black womanist theologies and Christologies. What is the substance of Black life in light of a good God and the evil of white supremacy and patriarchy? The cross, Jesus suffering, bleeding, and dying is the black story. It makes Jesus story the black story. And yet the suffering of the cross and the suffering concomitant with the black story must not be glorified. It must be stopped. It must be repudiated and it must be abolished. Thank you. And sorry for going over time. Let me stop my share. There is certainly no need to apologize to us for going over time, either of you. Um, I would like for us to take a little while uh, as a fishbowl group and have a chance to listen to Ebony and Rita talk with each other about these two lectures and how, uh, where they see points of convergence, points of divergence, where they, um, where they have really resonated with one another. Uh, and Kelly, thank you so much for translating this for us on behalf of uh, those who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, can we pin 
uh, Rita in here and let her and Ebony talk together for a few minutes. If you all think that's a terrible idea, you're welcome to say, no, thanks. Oh, I think it's a great idea. Here we sorry, I was having idea. some technical difficulties. I'm sorry about that, but we got it worked out. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, I just want to say that was awesome, Ebony. I it it was wonderful to see Katie Cannon in the video, um, and to be reminded of Dolores Williams' early pivotal, important work um, critiquing the whole idea of any substitutionary violence. Um, and the exploitation involved in all of that. Um, uh, so I just I just want to thank you. I, and I also like the way you threaded that needle <laughs> between um, the rejection of the body and the cross and C Cone's work on the lynching tree. At, at, there are so many ways in which Black theology focuses on the crucifixion, but I think none of it takes you to those traditional atonement theologies, um, but that there are differences. And Jim and I, Jim Cohn and I actually had a 20 year argument going. <laughs> <laughs> um, we agreed on 95% of what we thought about the cross and the atonement, but, but I thought he was leaning too far on sanctifying the cross to sanctify lynching in some kind of way that bothered me. And so we had a 20 year argument about that. No, I think, and I think, I think you were probably on the right side of that, right? I mean, and even in his posthumous work, um, I think it could absolutely be said that he he clearly comes down on the side of Niebuhr, that there is a tragedy and that there is a beauty, right, in the cross. He is Bardian through and through. I mean, yes. as for as much as he's a Black liberation <laughs> theologian, right, he wants that cross. Yeah. And I think that is, in many ways, um, womanist black women's departure from i mean there are a lot of ways that black women depart from Kuhn, right yes um but that is one of the the ways that black women depart from cone right we don't want to give we we, we need to attend to the cross and the crosses of uh, our lived realities and also we don't ever want to glorify it or allow for it to have any beauty. I mean, one of the ways we see this, um, Rita, contemporarily, or one of the ways that I've um, more recently like seen it, you know, um, observed it happening is during the whole George Floyd uh, lynching. And, you know, a lot of the language in the media was around how it became like how George Floyd gave his life, you know, and he yeah. sacrificed his life. And I'm like, you know, the woman is to me is like, no, he didn't. Like he didn't, he didn't give his life. And I would argue that of Jesus too. It was yeah. taken, it was taken from Jesus by sin and yeah. um, by, by an know, empire. By that's by right. Like that's law right. enforcement took that his life is and law right. enforcement he didn't, took George he didn't Floyd's life. Give it, it was taken. And we have to, and there's no beauty in that. Yeah. Right. There was only tragedy in that. And we have to be able to deal with that and account for that in our pulpits uh, and in our congregations. Because Black death cannot be that which, you know, allows for the remission of white sin. It just yeah. can't be. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and then there was also, with the death of George Floyd, the mm -hmm. traumatized bystanders. Right. And no, nobody talked about that young woman who sat on the stand and said, I feel guilty because I couldn't do more to save him. And she's the right. only one that got that video. And right. she had the courage to stand up to those cops who kept telling her to go away and she wouldn't stop filming. Right. Um, and yet she felt guilt. She felt right. sad and guilty. She didn't feel redeemed by him. Right. I mean, just imagine how, how right, you, even your retelling of that narrative parallels with Golgotha, right? And, and in both instances, we can find ourselves, you know, proclaiming a certain beauty of that moment. And no, the moment is filled for all involved with just with trauma, right? With tragedy, with despair, with grief, with violence, you know, and, and for such a, a, for us to kind of be a part of, however we might align, you know, align ourselves with the tradition, such a violent tradition, we do a horrible job of talking about it and making sense of it. I guess and it's I, so- 
And I feel uh, like ahead. sometimes Sorry. it's to make ourselves feel better about how awful it was that we want to sort of sanctify the victim and make George Floyd into a salvific Christ figure or something. Right. It's, it's like to right. try to soften the blow of how dead, just dreadful it really was. Yeah. How horrifying. Uh, it horrified the planet. I mean, there were demonstrations on seven continents. Yeah. It, well, and and the interesting thing and, and what I tried to demonstrate in, in my kind of mo photo montage is that George Floyd wasn't the first. Right. And as we know today, right, is not the last. Like yeah. Black people have been dying, have been dying as um, lynchies from, you know, our earliest times, certainly in this uh, colonial project that we now know as the US and people of color more broadly, right? Because, you know, there are um, specific kinds of violences meted out on people of color. Um, and, 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 right. And so, I mean, what as a church do we have to say to this? Yeah. Um, what does it, what does our partaking as Baptists, right? In a holy communion, um, say to the realities of shed blood, what James Cohen would call blood crying out from the ground right now. Yeah. Um, how do we, how do we preach that? How do we make sense of it? How do yeah. we resist it? How do we abolish it? Those are the questions that follow me. Yeah. And I, I, in my tradition, elders, uh, different kinds of people preside at the communion table and do meditations. And so every time I'm up, I try to reinterpret that moment as a resurrection time, a time to celebrate, you know, a, a feast of abundant life, all those sorts. But I know it makes people really uncomfortable when I won't say those words. This is my body broken for you. I don't say those words. I don't believe them. Yeah. Um, and so I say different things. And I and I know that there are people that really don't believe that communion happened because I didn't say the magic words. It's it's so interesting. Um I I can't like it to even reflect on how it performs, how the liturgy performs within black church traditions, uh especially the Black Baptist Church is just, uh, it's an exercise in grief for me because it is the participation and the sacralization of our own demise. Um, yeah. And uh, I just don't know, um, I don't know how to get around it. Yeah, know. we need, mm -hmm. we, we have to have new music, new liturgies. Uh, it's the ritual that implants the meaning. I think Tracy Lerman's book, How God Becomes Real, is very clear about that. You, it's the ritual that does the implantation of the deepest parts of the meaning system in your body and its performance. Right. And when that theology is buried in your body, it is a major dredging act to pull that up and try to fix it without rituals that help right. fix it, Right. That's right. I think that is one of the biggest challenges we face is how do we create the rituals that are actually life giving? And there's some stuff from the early church, but it's very patriarchal also. I mean, it, right. we need a new discourse that that is post-colonial, not imperial and all kinds of other things. That's um, right. And I a think we need a new way. Jesus movie. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. And I think that it's going to take, I mean, I, I love this language of performance and ritual because it's going to take our bodies kind of re-choreographing, right? The story yeah. um, in order to do, in order to do this kind of deep um, work, this yeah. deep liturgical work. And I'm not sure, I mean, and that's, I mean, that's kind of why I point to the body, right? As a mechanism for understanding Jesus anew. Yeah. Right. And that is just kind of emerging right out of womanist, black womanist theological traditions. But um, it's going to take take us really putting our bodies on the line to do yeah. um, to do that serious work. I'm not sure if we're up to it. You know, we're not as 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 Christians, but as as Baptists, especially. I mean, are, are we body people? I don't know. Oh, not Protestants. Uh, uh, we uh, we sit <laughs> little quietly in a pew and listen to the word and warble a few songs and maybe pass a cup. That's all the body is doing. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, 
I, I guess, I guess in, in, I don't, I don't know. It's weird because on the one hand you could say, especially in black Baptist traditions and black church traditions, right. That the body is very central to worship, but then it's, it's a, it's, it's, um, a prescribed, right. A yeah. bodily kind of interaction. Right. Yeah. And, and anything that deviates from that is, um, is a problem. So, yeah. so I don't, I just, I just don't know. I, I don't, don't know, know either, but it, it um, I, the, I think that one of the, the tragedies, I think, in Protestantism that's afflicting us now more deeply than ever is um, the rejection of ritual, where mm. we narrowed everything down to discourse, to word, and mm. everything's supposed to serve the word rather than the word serving life. And mm. so, so we don't have rich ritual. We don't have rich traditions of aesthetic appreciation. I, I remember walking into St. Peter's in Geneva where Calvin preached and it looks like a mausoleum. It's gray with brown mm -hmm. pews and, and the only real art is stained glass windows. But they kept one chapel that's the Catholic version of St. Peter's. And you walk mm -hmm. in and it's full of color and smells and life. Mm. Um, and, and that's what Protestantism rejected for the word. Well, so and it's so it just, it's so interesting. I mean, I don't know if I, I would make a turn to, to Catholicism as a no, primary not, example. No, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know that's not what yeah, you're doing, yeah. but yeah, no, but, but no, we got other better, way, but, but just, <laughs> just what Protestantism walked away from and decided it would never do. But, and it's right? so interesting, right? Because, because part of understanding the word right is kind of that johannine reality that the yeah. word right Sends was made flesh right <laughs> right and so um and so our disregard for the body in service for the word is its own conundrum it's like yeah. its own it's it is it is it is sin at yeah. the um you know the turn to the word yeah. and the the move away from the it, it is its own kind of fracturing um yeah. sin what, one of the stories that's that haunts me about north the colonization of north america is the story of the first time the wampanoags and the puritans met mm -hmm. and it happens after a terrible winter for the puritans where they're stealing food from abandoned indian camps because they can't survive otherwise and it, I think it's pretty clear the Indians left at it out that they were worried about these lost people. So they didn't want to have any contact with them because of epidemics, but they right. fed them basically. Right. And so in the spring, the Native Americans are making the Wampanoags are making noises in the woods that sound like they were maybe doing a ceremony to adopt the Puritans or something because they did that sometime. Mm -hmm. And so the Puritans hear the noises and think they're going to get attacked. And so they're meeting in their meeting house to decide how they're going to deal with an attack from the Wampanoags. And there's a knock at the door. And this man is native, he's Wampanoag and he's knocking mm -hmm. at the door and they open the door. And in English, he says, welcome. Do you have any beer? <laughs> and they're sort of shocked because he'd been kidnapped and taken to England and then came back. So he spoke English mm -hmm. and he explained that they wanted to have a ceremonial. And so they have this greeting together. To, they're two groups and it's kind of a big ceremonial thing so the puritans in their very plain clothes and stuff try to figure out what they can do to be impressive so they shoot off their muskets mm -hmm. okay so they have mm -hmm. guns and they shoot mm -hmm. their guns the native americans come and they're really tall and really robust and healthy and they have feather they have like incredible things on their bodies and they have right. songs and, and and it's really clear that they wanted to adopt these poor people who seem so lost Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the Puritans thought that they had, you know, done, uh, you know, they, com they had a complete mismatch of values. Right. Um, right. And, right. And, and so, it, and, and the, and the, as soon as the th ceremony is over, the Wampanoags planted cornfields around the Puritan settlement. And the Puritans thought yeah. they'd sold their land to them or something. And so they were, they would start arresting Wampanoags who came into the cornfields. I was like, ugh, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But in any case, that that um, sense of the loss of attunement to the beauty of creation, the beauty of the body, the beauty of the earth, all mm -hmm. of that, I think, is completely disappeared by atonement theology. 
Absolutely. And I think, right. And, 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 and part of that is the, right. The big me that is a part, right. That individualized reality that you spoke about earlier, right. That is a part of atonement theology, right. It is about me. It is about possession. It is what drives, right. Um, kind of the, the, the manifest destiny, right. The kind of, um, uh, people say American triumphalism, but the kind of the European triumphalist vision of, um, you know, of acquisition, of taking, yeah. right, yeah. as mine right. and as possessing. Yeah. And uh, it's it's really interesting how that ties into um, puritanical theology and also ties into um, so much contemporary evangelical theology um, that is really very individual and yes. not concerned at all about the social social realities that affect right. all of our bodies. That's so. right. It's a kind of narcissism. Right. In, in songs like Jesus loves me, only me, and God loves me, and everything's about me. <laughs> and, and God bless America, America nobody else. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and, and praise God, praise God, as if God needed praising, as right. if God also were a narcissist. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. God is also right, but God would have to be a narcissist, right? To kill his, to 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 give his, his kid own. over to the devil, to, right? Right. Yeah. So it, it all holds together. It's it just does. quite sick. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So um, um, you all have astonished us for the last hour wholesale, <laughs> and um, we could sit for another hour and listen to you talk back and forth. This is the richest conversation most of us have been in for years. Uh, and I'm so thankful. Um, my uh, assumption all along has been that it's a fear of change, that it's just such a big shift, you know, that if the cross doesn't mean what we grew up thinking it meant, um, then we've got nothing, there's nothing, you know. And so uh, hearing you address the kinds of things that mitigate the fear of making the shift, you know, Better ritual, a, a new Jesus movie, um, understanding stories that are not that are not white U.S. American stories. Listen, listening to stories that are not white U.S. American stories, and uh, have, finding the courage to have some empathy uh, to to hear you tell your stories and hear others tell their stories and learn for them from them. Um, you have clearly paved a way forward for us one of the comments in the chat was so how does our um how does our what would our remembrance of jesus be like after our learning at this conference so you're really sowing deep seeds for us as a as a denominational like thing <laughs> as a community uh, as individual congregations as individuals uh, and we're beyond grateful i have Thank i have two two final words to say one is if you haven't read Maranatha by Kathleen Corley, read it. It is a completely different interpretation of the gospel stories as the poetry written by women that is lamentation poetry. Okay. And, and it, it, it changes my, it changed my whole sense of what the gospels were about uh, in a way that sees them as that kind of comfort in suffering, that loving remembrance of someone beloved in their community. Yeah, Missy, um, see your question. And we're, uh, the planning team is already working on a, a, a resource list that's as comprehensive as we can make it that's come out of this weekend. So well, that that's one. And then the, the other thing is, I want to quote from Suge Avery too, where she says, you have to get that old white man off your eyeball. And we have to get that old cross off our eyeball. Yeah. Mm. Yes. And the old white man, God, that, that too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But even yeah. feminists that don't have that God sometimes still have the cross on their eyeball. Very true. Very true. <laughs> yeah. Thank you both yeah. with more words than I have to thank you with. Anita is going to come back and give us a few announcements and offer a benediction, but super blessings on you for bringing thank this. You. To thank you, thank Rita. You. Thank it's you, Ebony. It was great. We have to keep talking about this. <laughs> I would love to. Great.